Hey guys, thank you very much for listening to another episode of the Profitable Practice Podcast. I would love nothing more than for you to be able to leave a review. I get so much joy out of listening and reading the amazing things that you guys say about this. So please subscribe to our channel, leave a review and share it with your friends. Let's get some more fantastic information out there so all of us can grow the industry together. Cheers for now. Whether we like it or not, the NDIS is here to stay and with it comes a whole complexity of uh, different avenues including reporting that has a major uh, bearing on time, efficiency, outcomes, funding models, etc. for our clinics, for our clients and as a net result I'm going to get stuck into right now the eight keys that you must ensure to provide great, effective, excellent reports that will actually drive the results and outcomes you need and most importantly your client needs. So let's get stuck in right now. First and foremost we must understand that the NDIS is literally a different beast that we're only just really starting to uh, understand and figure out how it works. And look, to be totally honest, there's probably people that are listening to this right now that are saying, well, you know, we've got decision makers and policy makers, uh, organizations, etc., that don't even know what's going on with it or really understand it. And you know what? In many respects, that is completely true. We do have people in positions of power that are making decisions on people's lives, whether it is the practitioners, whether it's the um, you know uh, policy makers, whether it's the, the clients themselves, and they may not be the best people to be doing it. But here's the thing, there's no use us having a whinge and a bitch about uh, that scenario. That's the way it is, and it's going to take us a lot of time to make those changes and get those structural changes that are going to be the best things for us moving forward. What we should be doing is obviously advocating as best we can, putting suggestions forward, being on panels, getting groups and organizations better aware of what needs to happen, and hopefully making sure that we actually have the right people then uh, acting on our best interests as well. And I know that there are uh, uh, one particular allied health professional that are really not happy with uh, the way they've been uh, represented or in many respects misrepresented at times in and around the uh, the NDIS. They haven't been at the right uh, meetings etc and as a net result one of the biggest problems that are actually being faced is the fact that those uh, industry professionals have actually now been put in the wrong uh, category and that creates a huge amount of trouble moving forward in regards to where funding is allocated, what funding can be utilised and you know what, the whole thing is an absolute mess because of uh, the, the way it was mishandled at the start. But this isn't about having a whinge and a bitch about that. It's understanding that those things have actually happened. Uh, it is in place for what it is and steps are being put in place and are hopefully going to be happening to make that much better for everyone moving forward. What we need to make sure across this whole scenario is that we are actually doing everything we possibly can to put our best foot forward so that we actually are best representing ourselves personally and professionally at all times. We're best representing our clients and getting the best outcomes that we can based under the model or the circumstance that is actually surrounding us. In other words, we, we, get, we might have been dealt some really bad cards. We need to do everything we can to make the best opportunity out of the really bad deal, dealing of cards, a bad deal that we've actually been given. Uh, there's no use whinging about the cards that are in front of us. They've fallen that way. Let's actually proactively put steps in place to make that as best a situation as possible. And one of the things we do need to stop and get uh, you know, better control of is the way in which we talk and communicate and report on the clients that we actually are working with. That's why I think it's really important that this podcast was put into place because I get uh, business owners and health professionals contacting me all the time wanting to know the best things uh, to do and say and the best ways that they can actually structure their NDIS reports so that they can get 
uh, that I guess obviously optimize funding, optimize the opportunity for their clients and obviously get the most amount of um, outcomes that are in the best interest of their clients. And so the way I look at it and the way that I've been working with a lot of our allied health professionals is that there's probably eight parts that uh, we need to really you know, focus in on eight keys to having fantastic NDIS reports that are gonna drive better outcomes for our clients. And so when we dig down into that right now, the first one is step one and the key number one is understanding that the NDIS is a different beast. It's a different system to what's been out there. And obviously it's been set up the NDIS to support people with disabilities so that we can have them participate fully in the economic and social life of our community. All right, it's, it's put in place to have funding there for what's reasonable and necessary supports for people with disabilities to achieve their own goals in life. All right, so we need to make sure that obviously as health professionals, we have evidence-based reports that are in place um, you know, whether that's from physio, exercise physiology, speech pathology, occupational therapists, dietitians, etc. And so that's obviously the skill side and the expertise determining or meant to be determining who is going to receive the certain amount of NDIS funding given for a particular support. And so keeping in mind that NDIS is different as a organization, what it's been set up for, the actual scheme itself is completely different. And so knowing that the reports need to be different is something that uh, is fundamentally missed from quite a few health professionals. So they might be a different scope, it might be a different context. The content is definitely gonna be different. The level of detail that other reporting structures that we need to work on and provide at different points in time are completely different. So first and foremost, make sure that you understand that the NDIS is different and therefore the language being used is different as well. And so key number two needs to be that we actually have to start with some really simple, easy to understand language. Um, we do this all the time. We notice that colleagues or you know, maybe it's ourselves even, actually are using too much jargon, too much technology, uh, technology not technology, too much um, terminology. Uh, we might want to talk about uh, aspects that would have got us good marks at university with our academic lecturers, but unfortunately in the real world, that's actually the worst thing for us to be actually doing. We need to actually keep it very simple, we need it very plain, we need to work with normal everyday people uh, in the real world as health professionals, but you've got to actually also understand that a lot of the time you're going to be working with, or you will be always working in the NDIS system with people that actually have a disability and a lot of the time they might actually have limited um, literacy skills. They might have uh, different various forms of communication or they may not actually speak English as their first language at all. So we need to be making sure that we're not um, we're not oversimplifying and dumbing things down because we're uh, being rude, but we're actually got to understand that the plain language and the information needs to be actually not losing its meaning. We've got to make sure we keep it simple and plain and easy to understand so that the people that we're talking and engaging with aren't going to struggle with the complex concepts that we're talking about, or maybe it's been translated by a, a support worker, etc. So not only is that the way we need to talk with the client, but we also need to replicate that in plain language in the report. So that it's not always going to be the specialist expertise, terminology and jargon of someone reading it that you're gonna sit there and go, oh, this person's very academically minded. A lot of the time, it's going to uh, go to uh, informed decision making by non-specialist readers. So we need to make sure that the evidence in these reports uh, to those NDIS planners is very simple and very plain. Uh, quite often the NDIS participants and their families will need to be able to read them and understand them. The local area coordinators, support coordinators, etc. same thing. So just make sure that you know we find out what the, uh, the level of understanding is around language and communication so that we tailor that to the needs of the outcomes that we're trying to get with the people that we're communicating with. And that's key number two. When we move to uh, key number three, and I just started to mention it there, we need to make sure that we're actually providing evidence for everything, okay? Um, there's a huge value uh, placed on 
uh, inside the NDIS itself on the evidence of needs. So the needs analysis, right? Uh, we need to make sure it's, we've, we put the value on the effectiveness of a given support or approach. It's not just an endless money pit of, yep, they're gonna do this, they're gonna have this, etc., etc. Um, the NDIS doesn't make decisions based on how well you can persuade or how you can, you know, argue your point, etc. It has to be objectively viewed between the needs of the participants' goals and the outcomes and what is professionally able to be completed. So you want to try and always link the uh, results and outcomes that you believe you can achieve and will achieve to the goals that are actually put in place. So if the participant actually has a particular goal that uh, they're wanting to actually be able to uh, achieve, then we need to make sure that we actually can link the results in our reporting to actually evidence how that service delivery is going to be able to uh, provide that given or requested goal. So that's what we need to really start to do. Um, we wanna be able to present the view that if we're providing these recommended supports, we're going to be able to improve the individual capacity through X, Y, and Z, and we wanna be able to actually evidence, evidence that. But again, it's not about to persuade or to argue. You've gotta be objective as to how that's gonna happen, why it's gonna happen, and how it's in the best uh, needs for the participant to reach those goals and outcomes that were put in place originally. And so that's step number three. When we start to move to, uh, you know, like the fourth really big key in this process, we need to make sure that all of the recommendations that we actually put forward are very, very clear. Now, I've read a lot of NDIS reports. I've seen so many people that, uh, you know, want to have a whinge and whine about, you know, a report they put through with recommendations. And when I sit there and read it, I think to myself, you know what, it's actually a little bit you know, confusing as to what they're actually asking for. Uh, if we're going to be asking for what you believe is reasonable and necessary, it needs to be clear. It needs to be a strong recommendation, so that there is no um, no misconception, or there can't be a misunderstanding or non-clarity of expectation moving forward from what's been said. So make sure that you have clearly visible recommendations, all right? Uh, I think it's always best to have the recommendations at the beginning of the document. It's almost uh, like a bit of a summary type thing so that we can get that in place. So that when someone goes to look at it a second time or a third time or review it later, they don't necessarily have to pick apart the whole report. They might wanna just go back and reference something that's very simple and clearly at the front of the report that they can't remember the exact details of. So let's make sure that we have very clear headings, uh, that it's very easily uh, seen that these are our recommendations because ultimately that's going to be one of the most important parts of the reports you're going to do as an allied health professional within the NDIS scheme. And when we talk about the recommendations, we want to make sure that we have specific quantities. We don't just want to say that someone is going to improve their, their strength or they're going to um, you know, be in a scenario where they're you know, more, more uh, active in society. Let's try and put some more quantitative assessment in and around the recommendations. All right, if, if we can put something in place where we're actually going to talk about how much uh, we're going to increase their gross motor skills with their overall uh, body conditioning and strength, this is obviously going to be much better uh, targeted and quantified to the goal of increasing their independence in their home and their community, which is probably something that's put in their plan as their goals originally. So let's try and keep as much of those um, quantifiable specifics in place because that's obviously going to make sure that goes to that, the key of being clear and strong and visible in the recommendations that we actually give when doing NDIS reports. Key number five, and this is probably one of the most crucial parts of this, is you have to understand reasonable and necessary. All right. The NDIS only funds supports for NDIS participants that are reasonable and necessary. And that's actually defined in uh, six criteria. It's in section 34, the NDIS Act from 2013, off memory, 2013, off memory, yeah. So here's the thing. They actually state that any type of support, including therapies, will only be approved by the NDIS if requests meet all six criteria. 
And those six criteria mean that they must, the supports must be goal oriented they must facilitate social and economic participation, they must be value for money, they must be effective and beneficial, following best practice, right? Um, it needs to be not, uh, not be more appropriately provided by family or the broader community. Okay, so it goes to the specificity of what's reasonable and necessary. And the number six needs to not be more appropriately funded by another service, um, such as like other parts of the health system or the education system um, or justice system, I suppose, is another one as well. So the, probably one of the biggest things is I think that we, as practitioners, want to get on our high horse a little bit too much in regards to try and justify things. and. What we need to do is, yes, absolutely justify it and be very quite explicit in the way we justify it, but we need to make sure that we're very reasonable in what we're deeming is fair and fair and reasonable, fair and sensible, right? Um, we need to make sure that we actually show the necessity of it, okay? We can't just be turning around and saying, well, this is what's happening because this is the funding that, they, that they've got or this is what we're going to be doing and blah, blah, blah. You need to make sure that you can clinically provide the evidence around what is reasonable and necessary matching those six criteria from the uh, Section 34 of the NDIS Act of 2013. So you have to make sure that the, uh, the support and the therapy linked to that disability is reasonable and necessary and you need to make sure that you're very clear around that so that you show them that all of the supports are goal orientated in the plan. All right, we wanna keep that very, very specific. We wanna quantify things where we can and we wanna make sure that we've actually got that value for money in place so that there's no uh, misconceptions, there's no misunderstanding or misreading of your uh, recommendations that they are very clearly outlined and mapped against what is reasonable and necessary criteria defined by the NDIS. Now key number six that I wanted to point out is that the therapies must achieve outcomes. And that's something I've you know, mentioned quite a few times already, but it's a specific point that I think we need to keep a focus on, all right? We must achieve an outcome. We must be in line with those goals moving forward and we need to have quantifiable outcomes of those interventions recommended in the report, all right? Um, we should try and, as many times as we can in these reports, detail the risk of not providing the recommended supports, like if it's relevant. So if there's sound rationale for how the individual's impairment or disability may actually worsen without them, then absolutely we need to be very, very clear of them such as a lack of regular physiotherapy may lead to a loss of mobility, resulting in decreased social and economic participation in the following three or six or 12 months. So we need to make sure that we actually do state the risk of not having that support as well. And that's part of that justification that is completely feasible and expected in an NDIS report. We wanna make sure that when we actually achieve outcomes, uh, or that probably more so that we identify those measures, so we might actually have a success statement for each goal as to how we're defining that outcome. Not just we want to improve such and such, we want to actually make sure that we have something in place that is a measure of success. Now that might be in regards to um, how someone completes particular activities at home. So we want to actually maybe talk about whether they can or cannot therefore complete lawn mowing or washing the dishes those type of things are measures of success that need to be listed. Again, it's not about saying whether someone can do something or can't do something, we need to be very specific. We wanna make sure that all of that is in place so that it is very clear on the outcomes and the identified measures of success. Probably these last two are, are something that uh, is pretty, um, uh, pretty it's a bit, look, they're very, very relevant, but I think it's probably something that's a little bit more of a given that we also go, well, well, I know that, I should do that. But there are a lot of times and a lot of stories that we are hearing about people that aren't following this. And key number seven is staying within your scope. So stick to the area of your expertise. We don't want to be undertaking assessments or making um, assertions and recommendations that are outside your field of expertise. We want to make sure that all the assessments that are completed are evidenced. We want to make sure that we're very clear with our recommendations and that we have 
those uh, measured success parameters in place. We want to make sure that we don't step outside our, um, our commentary and what we put inside those reports that are out, actually outside of our scope. All right, We want to make sure that that's in place. And it sounds like a very simple one. I, the vast majority of people do do that, but just make sure that we're not putting uh, particular uh, assumptions or recommendations or commentary in those reports that are outside or detailing parts or processes uh, that probably you shouldn't actually be reporting on or assessing in the first place. And the very last one is make sure that the readability of that report is in place and that it can actually be very structured and get the purpose and the outcome that you're needing when you move forward. Because here's the thing, I see it all the time with um, therapists and clinics, they have all these different templates for report writing and all these things in place which in many respects can be very great, but we want to make sure that we have our own uh, template moving forward for the NDIS. Again, it's a different beast and the NDIS haven't provided a standard template like you know most you know workers compensation insurance schemes have etc um, you know New South Wales has their AHRR forms etc they don't have a templated or standard template for therapists to use inside the NDIS so therefore you can get basically a, a lot more freedom to say and do whatever you want but the main thing is at the end of the day get a structure that's very professional that um, clearly identifies the purpose of the report, what you're trying to actually recommend, that it's actually evidence, and therefore it will obviously assist the funding decisions of the people reading those as they move through that report. So make sure that you use appropriate headings, make sure that you use tables, keep things very simplified with the dot points, the simple and plain, easy to understand language, stick away from all of the jargon, make sure that they know who's involved with this assessment, what you're recommending, the context around the client, the reason for the referral, and as a net result, you're going to have reports that are a lot more easily read. And when things are more easily read with the right information from the people that are actually in this process, you're going to find a lot greater success with your NDIS reporting moving forward. And ultimately, it's going to get the right result for the client. It's going to enable you're going to get more allocation of funding to provide the evidence that you have based on the criteria that you have, you've responded to the reasonable and necessary criteria, you've used plain language, it's easy to understand, everyone's very clear, everyone's got the same understanding and expectation and as a net result, that is going to leave you in the best stead to get the most outcomes in a positive light for you, your business and your client moving forward. And so there guys are the eight uh, simple keys that you need to make sure that you include and have mastered for your NDIS reports. Make sure it's templated. If you've got any questions, reach out to me because they are quite simple and quite easy to do and to match. And when you get it right, you're going to be able to get a lot more beneficial outcomes for your clients. You know, it can be a good avenue for your business moving forward as well to be able to um, maybe have this as a bit of a niche area for you to work with. And ultimately, it's going to make your experience with the NDIS uh, a lot more streamlined for the areas that you can actually influence. And that's what we're talking about here in this podcast. It's about what we can influence in the areas of the NDIS that we can actually get the most positive outcome and change and influence over. That's all from now, guys. Go and get stuck in. Keep those eight keys, and no doubt you'll get a lot better uh, at the reporting structure and get a lot better outcomes on multiple levels within the NDI scheme from here. Talk to you soon. Hi, Jason Pilgrim here from the Profitable Practice Podcast, where we help allied health professionals just like you empower and inspire the lives of so many more people by building bigger and better businesses. Let's go and get stuck in right now.